please. Thank you, James. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as James said, I'm Melise Camargo. I'm acting head of training services at Cambridge International. So I'm part of the professional development team in the teaching and learning division. And I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you very much for joining us. It's an immense pleasure to have you all here. We hope you will enjoy this hour with us. Just to explain how the session will work, so I will kick us off with my takeaways from the keynote presentation. I will then invite you all to participate in an activity with the Mentimeter. So a link will be posted on the chat so you can contribute. Please click on the link when it's time to do so. After that, I'll pass on to three panelists who will be sharing their tips for effective remote learning. You will hear from Nivedita, who also works at Cambridge International, Claire, who is one of our trainers, and Karen, a teacher from a Cambridge school in the United States. When they finish their presentations, then it's your turn again. We will ask you to contribute with your tips, because we know that you will have plenty to share. So again, another link will be posted on the chat box. Please click on the link to, to share your tips. And after that, we'll finish off with questions and answers. As James explained, uh, the chat is open for the whole session, so you don't need to wait till the end to ask your questions. And if you want a specific panelist to answer, please make sure you include that in your question as well. Okay, so let's get started. Um, as I said, I will start sharing a few takeaways that I had from Rhonda's presentation. And I really enjoyed it. I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed it, uh, especially because I think she touched on very important points. And also she reassured us about all the good things everyone is doing. And we know how hard this year has been to everyone, but we all appreciate the, the hard work. So the first point that I want to highlight from her presentation is it's when she mentioned about the different types of learner engagement. I'm not teaching at the moment, but I, I used to be a teacher. And since the pandemic started, I've been reflecting a lot about what I would be doing right now, how I would be acting as a teacher with my own learners. And when she mentioned about the engagement, it, it was a, an eye opener for me. So that was really interesting because, of course, when thinking about like what she explained that we have the behavior engagement, the aff affective behavior uh, engagement and the cognitive. When I'm teaching face to face, I always have that in mind. So when I'm planning my lessons, but I. I had in my mind when she started talking that maybe if I was teaching remotely, I would be mostly fo focusing on the behavior engagement. So that made me think and caught my attention. So how my, actually my behavior would change with my learners if we were doing it remotely. The second point that I want to highlight is related to the first one in a way, because when Rhonda said, excellent online teaching occurs because of the teacher's thinking. Uh, I think that's really interesting to hear. And I'm saying it's related to my first point, because if I was teaching now, I think I would be thinking a lot. And, and what is the, the what I can do to really engage my students? And again, like I said, not just in the behavior sense, but actually effectively and cognitively. So that made me think a lot. And, the, and that brings to my third takeaway as well, which actually comes from her Q&A session and not from her presentation. But thinking back about what I just mentioned, like about teachers thinking and how to engage in, in students, I really liked one of the questions that asked that, like when we are thinking about planning and all this thinking that the teachers have to do, these are principles of good teaching in general, things that apply when we are doing it either face to face in a room where, with our students or online. So then the person asks, what's different? What sort of thinking that teachers actually should be doing right now when teaching in an online environment? And I think her, her answer was spot on, like the difference is on how you use the technology. So essentially it's like, 
how the teacher will be thinking about and shifting their thinking to think about what they can do in an online environment that they would not be doing in a face-to-face -face environment. So I think like that was really interesting to see. Of course, I could go on and on and keep talking the whole day if you allow me, but that's not the point here today. So I'm going to stop here so we can actually start our session. And again, a very warm welcome from us. Thank you very much for joining us today. So, uh, like I said, I would invite you to participate with us in a Mentimeter activity. So there's a link that has been posted in the chat box. So please click on the link. And what you are asking you to contribute is about, like, in your opinion, what words or phrases sum up good practice in remote teaching and learning? So you have to type the code that is on the screen to be able to access and be able to answer the question. We can see that a few contributions are coming in. Yeah, so we have a big word right at the center there in blue saying engaging. So yeah, that's really interesting to see that that's one of the words we are using to, to sum up good practice in remote teaching and learning. And I agree, agree completely, it needs to be engaging. Collaboration, another one. Which of course is really important. However, they both apply to face to face as well. So can we think about things that it's like practice in remote teaching and learning. Less teacher time talking, I like that one. Balance, flexibility. Internet connection, yeah, that's definitely an important one. If any of the panelists what would like to join me here, please do so. Melissa, I like the one that says patience. I think um, definitely uh, we've had to be quite um, patient with, with the technology and ourselves and our students during this time. Yeah, I agree completely, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> Autonomy, yeah, I really like that one as well. And that's something that I've been hearing from colleagues and yeah, my, my colleagues that are still teaching uh, they say like one of the things that they've seen changing in their learners is that they're much more autonomous now that they are in an on online environment so i think that's quite interesting i think flexible flex yeah as teachers we really have to be flexible in these situations yes thank you Loretta. i agree yeah. Supportive, I like, yeah, we definitely need to And be I also supportive. like the one that says preparedness because um, I think uh, Rhonda touched on how much extra um, preparation we need to do when we're teaching remotely. Uh, you would think that it might be easier from when you think about it without actually doing it, but um, teaching online definitely requires a lot of preparation. Yeah. I there's agree, some Claire. responses yeah. coming. There are some responses coming in the chat as well, so like brainstorming, planning. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Rhonda touched on planning as well, right? And I think it's what Claire just said as well about being prepared. Exactly. The plan, yeah, planning is really important. <laughs> yeah, tons of planning, Amira. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Indeed, yeah. Differentiation, yeah, that's a really good one um, that we we need to think about. Absolutely. So yeah, it's really interesting to see these words coming up and and what is it that we are thinking when we are thinking about like good practice in remote teaching and learning. Yeah, organized resources, understanding, definitely. Yeah, these are all very important things. Thank you very much, everyone. Very interesting. But yeah, engaging, it was kept right at the, the center there since the beginning. And it is something that, yeah, definitely we have to have in our in our minds when in a remote and teaching, remote teaching and learning environment. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, that was very, very interesting to see. So now I'm going to pass on to Niveta, who will introduce herself and we will share her tips. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mavis. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Divedita Boats, and I'm the Senior Education Manager for Cambridge International. I'm based in uh, New Delhi, India. So I will be just talking for five minutes about a few of my learnings uh, from Rhonda's talk and Q&A, in addition to what Melissa has already shared. And I also have a couple of slides with some tips for maths and science uh, remote teaching that I think would be very, very important. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, these are some of the top tips that I liked and I put together in collaboration with one of our Cambridge trainers. So these I can't take credit for these slides. I have taken it in consultation with one of our trainers. So uh, the top tips according to me would be a consistent structure together with clear and simple instructions because that helps students to adapt to independent working. Uh, if you see on the slide, there's a small lesson plan which uh, has been created for students and which has very clear uh, breakups in the lesson plan with time. So including time helps students to know how long they should spend on each task and then that in turn helps them manage their time better and also compare uh, how long they take to do a task when they are doing it independently or when they are doing it collaboratively or under the guidance of a teacher. There are a number of resources available online uh, for you to use, but you are free to create your own. But just make sure uh, that it has a consistent structure, clear, simple instructions, uh, assessment for learning evidence that you can uh, check, and also support for your students in, in uh, I would say, whichever way is comfortable to them. So in the morning session, somebody was saying, uh, that uh, there are some children who are not very willing to talk in a group, so they choose to interact with a teacher independently through messages. So any way which is, uh, you know, comfortable to your students, but at the same time also comfortable to you. Don't be afraid to ask students for their feedback on the sessions because that helps you know what they think and how what uh, changes you can bring in your planning. Next slide, please. This slide just lists some of the resources that are available from Cambridge website. So if you go to our website on teaching and learning, you will come across a number of resources. Uh, these would include getting started with series on active learning, assessment for learning, metacognition, effective questioning, etc. Then we also have some education briefs for you to go uh, to help you uh, dig a little bit deeper. Apart from the, uh, this, we also have a uh, lot of resources dedicated to teaching and learning in COVID times. So for various parts of world where uh, if the schools are closed, how to uh, manage the online teaching and learning, where the schools have come back, uh, how to assess the learning gaps and support students with that. Because in her presentation, Rhonda did mention that when we come back from the pandemic, we would find more variance in the performance of students in the classroom. 
so uh, we have tried to support that and also a lot of resources on the well-being of students as well as teachers next slide please and on this slide i have just compiled a uh, some of the resources which are available for teachers to use these are the, some of you may be already using some of them but there are some others which you find useful more of these are for maths but there are many which are also applicable for science so we will be sharing the slides and the recording with you after the session so uh, you will have access to all these links in the slide deck with that i would stop here and pass on to claire roper over to you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Nivedita. Um, and, and, and hello to everyone. Um, so when I was listening to Rhonda's um, talk, she opened by um, thanking us all as teachers for what we're doing um, during the pandemic. But um, actually, for me, I, I've, I found it a really exciting opportunity to try new things um, and uh, inspire my students. Um, and so particularly as science teachers, where I think that we've really had our subject highlighted during the pandemic. Um, scientists have been needed to solve all sorts of problems, understanding our numbers and developing new vaccines. And we're, we're in the position to be able to inspire that next generation of scientists to go on and do great things. And, and so I think actually we've had a, a fantastic opportunity to be with them during this really unusual time. At the start of lockdown, I told my students that we were embarking on a big experiment together. And I noticed that one or two of you put in the chat that you ask your students for feedback at the end of each session. And it's been the same for me. We've tried new things and found out what's worked. <clears throat> um, when Wanda um, opened a, com a conversation, she also um, mentioned a quote by one of her colleagues, uh, David Perkins. Uh, and he said, learning is a con consequence of thinking. That um, quote really resonated with me. Um, if you remember, she described how she used a frame from tic-tac-toe to help people um, see a pattern and then being able to understand a code. Um, so I've been using something similar uh, in my um, lessons using uh, a thinking maps. Um, so on this slide over here, um, you can see three of the eight thinking maps. Thinking maps are visual scaffolds that can um, be used for higher order thinking. And each one of the maps is linked to a specific thought process. So the map on the left is called a circle map and it's used for describing things. Uh, for instance, in a chemistry lesson, you might want to ask your students to describe transition elements. And in this wider circle, uh, they could write um, the things that are part of that description, such as catalysts or um, high density. So that would enable the students to think about uh, scaffolding their descriptions. The middle um, thinking map is called a brace map. I've taken a snapshot out of the middle of a, uh, of a brace map. So the left hand branch, the starting branch isn't there, but it could have been something like an atom. And then on the two uh, next levels, they, they could have written nucleus and electron cloud and then go down breaking into further and further pieces. I find these maps fantastic for differentiation because you could leave a very open stretch question which just says use a brace map to um, classify all the parts of an atom or you could um, ask them to uh, ha make a brace map that's just got three levels and not tell them how many parts on each level or you could give them a full scaffold and then ask them to fill it in. Uh, the, the thinking map that's on the right-hand side is called a double bubble map, um, which I think is a great name. And I've given an example um, of a double bubble map using veins and arteries. The bubbles in the middle um, would be for where you could put similarities between veins and arteries. And the ones on either side um, would be where you could put um, your differences so that you can find um, really good comparisons, sort of a compare and contrast kind of question. Um, so um, what I've done is, is used a number of these thinking maps with my students. And so on this next slide, you can see some of the examples that I've done with them. I've purposely taken really small um, screenshots of that um, slide. So I'm not expecting that you're going to be able to read what I've written. Well, it's not me, it's actually my students. Um, it's really more just the, the visual look at it. 
So on the top left hand side um, are two breakout rooms. Uh, the group that was in room two um, decided to put their flow map um, as a sequence just in a linear form. Uh, and a flow map is another type of thinking map. But the group that was in um, room five uh, decided to make a multi-flow map. The instruction that I had given this class was to make a flow map uh, for genetic engineering and all the steps that are needed in that process. And it allowed us to have really good conversations afterwards, comparing each other's flow maps, flow maps to look at how many steps we put in to the flow and, and this whole discussion as to whether this was a multi-flow map or it should have just been a linear sequence of events. Uh, so you might remember Rhonda having um, a question during the Q&A on Friday where she was asked about should we have our cameras on or our cameras off. Um, and when she addressed that question, she really said that if we can see their learning in action, sometimes having their cameras on isn't all that important. What's more important is being able to see uh, their working. And when I've been doing these flow maps and thinking maps with them online, I've definitely been able to see that they've been engaged with my lesson. Melissa, you said you were thinking about uh, behavioral um, aspects to engagement um, when you were wondering about how to teach online. Um, but actually, this is a really good example of cognitive engagement um, and how students can really engage on quite a deep level where they need to put their um, thoughts that you might have seen in a textbook or um, uh, discussed in a lesson into a sequence, into a, a scaffold that really does help them understand uh, the, the detail of that process. <clears throat> On the bottom right hand corner is actually a, a Venn diagram, um, which is not one of the uh, typical eight flow maps, but I definitely use it in biology where we've got often three things that we need to compare. In this example, arteries, veins and capillaries. Um, actually, this screenshot I took in the middle of a lesson and the students hadn't completely finished doing what they were. And so um, you would imagine that in that very middle place where they overlap, you would put things that are common to arteries, veins and capillaries. And then where they do overlap but just between the two, those would be similarities and the differences or the things that are unique to each in that area of the, of the circle that is just um, on the outside. Uh, the example that's in blue in the middle um, is um, another example of a multi-flow map. Uh, in this example, um, I'd ask the students to think about cause and effect. We were talking about the human influences on the environment. Um, and so the causes on the uh, left-hand side and then how they interacted with each other to um, have effects on the right-hand side. That was a really big challenge to the class and they really struggled to think about which ones go in which columns, what are causes and what are effects and involved in quite a lot of fantastic debate. And then um, I think we might be able to get the little video going on the bottom left hand corner, which is just a screenshot of me doing this live from um, one of my classes. Uh, so this is my screen at home and you can see the little cursors moving around. They've got the names of the students underneath. And so I can see which student is moving which block along um, from one place to another. Uh, and so I've been able to really see that they are engaging and who's in fact even written what. Uh, this is one of the tools that I think I'm going to take back to the classroom with me and continue to use. I might have done this um, in groups in, um, in class before lockdown, uh, but now I've actually seen how much benefit the students have had to have the freedom of not having a fixed piece of paper where they might be reluctant to cross things out, um, but actually they're much more confident about moving things around um, if it is not such a big investment to having written something on a piece of paper. And so um, this um, program uh, is, is one of two that you can use. That's an online collaborative platform for the, the students to um, engage in their working. And I'm now going to uh, pass over to Karen Strauss, who will tell you what she's been up to. Mm -hmm. All right. Good morning. My name is Karen Strauss. I am a uh, science teacher. I teach IGCSE, AS, and A-level chemistry here in sunny Florida in the United States. If you can see me, you can see me. I am in my classroom. I am a concurrent teacher, which means I have students in the class with me and on Zoom uh, remote at the same time, which brings a new whole level of crazy to this already crazy year. I'm gonna focus my instruction here, or my talk here, specifically on the AS level of practicals, which our AS students have to take. 
Um, again, you got to remember, we went on lockdown last spring in March, and so the students haven't been in here doing a lab, touching the materials, uh, and as some of them started this year, haven't been back yet, so it's been over a year that they haven't actually physically touched anything, okay? Um, and when they come back in here, they're extremely nervous about how to cover everything. And again, last spring, I didn't even finish my IGCSE. I didn't get through finishing the standards, let alone all the practical work. So when I started this year, I had to start thinking about um, how much, what do the students actually know coming in? And I had to assume they didn't really know, remember a whole lot. They didn't master IGCSE. So I started making a series of videos that I posted to my um, Blackboard page. Uh, we use Blackboard here, you have a website, whatever you're going to use. And I started with some easy, easy things like how to turn on the Bunsen burner. Too often students will turn the gas on, go to light it, and the flame doesn't catch, and they immediately turn off the gas where it's not. They need to adjust the air intake. So I go through all of this. What do they do once they get the flame up? How far do they set the crucible above the flame? One centimeter, five centimeters, 10 centimeters? What are they doing? They haven't really mastered IGCSE, so I had to kind of review all of those. How to fill the burette? I made a lovely video in which I'm pouring stuff, the solution, into the top of the burette, and the stopcock was open, and solution went everywhere. I look like a complete idiot in a lot of these videos, but it's kind of reminding the students what all to do. Now, I know there's a lot of great videos online. I have used a lot of those online. They really are wonderful. Uh, and a lot of great virtual labs, and I've used those too. My issue with the virtual labs are they're perfect. Nobody spills anything. Nobody breaks anything. Nobody sets anything on fire. It's perfect. But when you come into the classroom, we all know nothing ever works perfectly going on. So then I started creating a bunch of videos where what it is that is happening, what happens when you get into the classroom. In other words, you get the crucible on the stand and you go pick it up and you hold the um, clamps or the tongs the wrong way and you shatter the, the crucible. Well, what then? I mean, what do you do from then? And then I walk the through kid students through what you're going to do when this happens. What happens if the burette is leaking from the stopcock? No virtual lab really addresses this, so I walk them through. What are you going to do? I have broken more glassware, set more things on fire, and have kind of looked a bit like an idiot really to show the students what to do when something goes wrong in the real world that doesn't happen in a virtual lab. And they're posted on my website and the students kind of laugh at me all the time and they re-review them, so what's going on? Um, the other thing is, is when they do come in, they're going to be extremely nervous. I mean, the first time they have stepped foot in is gonna be for the Cambridge practical, the nerves are going to be very high. I need to remind my students that if they've done a titration, they've done the rough titration, and I can't, my talk is geared towards chemistry here, sorry, uh, and they've done titer one, titer two, titer three, titer fifth time, they still do not get two titers within 0.1 mils of each other, to remind them, go on. Cambridge is not looking for perfection. We are looking for understanding. Do the kids understand the concepts? If they don't get two titers within 0.1 mils, that's only one point. They can still prove they have understood this material and passed the exam. The next thing that I tend to do, oopsies, went one slide too many, sorry, um, is once we have gone through all the setup of the, the lab, the kids know what they're going to do, I then turn it over to my in-class students, okay? They become what I call the professors of the day. So you can see my students there on the computers, remote students. My computer sits in front of one of my in-school students. Now, people at remote have the same practical as my students that are in class. 
the students that are in class are not really supposed to give them information. I want the remote students to ask questions. Uh, the top left, you can see Elvira here doing a qualitative analysis. She's holding the test tube up. The students have to ask her, uh, do you see a precipitate? What color is the precipitate? What's happening when you add excess sodium hydroxide? Whatever there is. The remote students seem to be more comfortable asking questions to their classmates than they do to me. I guess I'm a little too scary, no. But they're comfortable asking their classmates and it allows the in-school student to be the professor. They can explain things, which no proves to me they understand what's going on. And it allows me to hear the questions. What did the remote students ask or what didn't they ask? That will tend to drive my instruction the next day. Bottom left, I've got Eric here. He's doing an enthalpy type lab. They can ask him, what was the mass? What was the temperature? All of those type things. And then they still do the full lab practical going on. And then I've got another student over here again, just this was early on in the year showing the setup and everything. I turn it over to my students to become the professors and I put onto the remote students them asking questions. What do they need to know to be able to work with this practical? All right. Uh, and I walk, this also gives me some one on one time with my other students in the room where I can walk away. I'm not tethered to the computer all the time. Um, I have created for Cambridge here a 30 minute video, which you're spending the day in my classroom. I also talk about safety issues I've put in for when the students do come back into class. Um, I've also pulled in a couple of my remote students. Uh, one, Emily, who is an AS level chemistry student. She's been fully remote since last March. She did come into the classroom one time in January and did a full lab practical or a Cambridge practical. I think it was 2016-35, doesn't matter. Uh, I had a remote, got permission for her to come in, and then I followed up where I interviewed her about what had happened is the first time your midterm exam depends upon how you did on this lab practical. So I interviewed a few of my students, if you can get a chance to watch that and feel how the remote students are feeling watching labs online versus practical, uh, doing the virtual labs. That's all I have. I'm going to pass it back. Um, on to Nivia, is that you? Now it's me, Nelizi. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very interesting, all three presentations. We're going to go back at the end and everyone will be able to ask any questions you have. So now, as I said, over to you again. So uh, a link will be posted on the chat now for a Padlet. So if you have never used the Padlet, so we are, what we are asking you to do is to share your practical tips for remote or blended learning. Uh, the link is there now. So please, if you've never used it, there is a plus box at the right bottom. So you just need to click on it and type your tips. Okay. And soon we're going to see the tips here in the, the screen and we can comment on it and, and learn from it. And this Padlet will be uh, available later as well, so you can go back and, and check the, the tips being shared by everyone. So please contribute and share your tips.
Yeah, we can see some things coming in now, which is quite interesting. Nearpod, yeah, that's something that was mentioned in the morning session. Well, morning for us in the UK, of course. Uh, morning session as well. Uh, virtual labs, definitely. Uh, you can see what's happening in the practical sessions. Uh, YouTube videos, yes, we mentioned that. Um, it's very interesting. Felisa, I can see that somebody's been using Miro like me. That's great. Yes, Miro is a great tool. Uh, I make my own videos. Yeah, I think that's really good. And I think like the good thing with videos is that you can reuse. You can edit a few bits that if you don't don't think it worked really well. OneNote, yeah. Make use of all the resources the internet offers. That's good. We just need to be careful and make sure that they meet our needs. Kahoot. Don't don't forget to to mention how you use those tools. Okay, so yeah, we have a little bit more detail. Yeah, bite-sized materials. So answer just one question or watch just a short video instead of doing like loads of questions in a very long video. I think like that's really, really good idea. Claire, do you want to come in? On event turn? Yeah, I can see some people have said FIT. Um, FIT is a great um, resource for simulations. Um, mostly it's used in chemistry and physics, but actually it's got some quite good ones for biology as well. I think we're all missing um, the ability to use um, oh, the, 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 quite a lot of our virtual experiments that have um, relied on uh, the JavaScript that's now not, not functioning anymore, but FET is still working. So um, they're really good. You can also collect data off them, which means that the students can really do some analysis. But I like the idea um, that some of you are also doing kitchen chemistry from home and, and Karen's um, link with uh, lessons uh, some at home and some in the school classroom. Yeah, I would also encourage uh, everyone to look at the resource plus, which is available on the website. Uh, we also have a student version of it. And for the sciences, we do have some virtual uh, experiments to uh, incorporate it in that, which are very useful. Yeah, I see someone mentioning Enrich. Yeah, that's a free resource as well. It is from the University of Cambridge and it's um, mathematics problems and they are really interesting. And yeah, I used to teach mathematics and I used to use them and they do make our students think and and talk mathematics like whomever posted it here saying, yeah, it, it's the language of mathematics because it's quite interesting to see them using in Enrich. It's really good and it's all free. And I can see somebody's also put whiteboard if I, that's another one that I've used quite a bit. That's a great resource for um, making sure that all your students are participating in a lesson. Uh, it's basically the same as them all having small mini whiteboards. Uh, you can see that all of the mini whiteboards on your screen um, and they write on their screen so they can show they're working and, and, and interact with a, a diagram that you might have put out for them. Um, so it's really much more for interact, uh, independent work rather than um, group work. But Whiteboard FI is, is a good, uh, good resource too. Thank you, Claire. Do you want to, to comment on anything, Karen? I just love, oh, great, there goes the bell at school. Sorry. I just love <laughs> everybody's answers. These are all, everybody seems so clever on what they're doing. I just remember last summer just being shell shocked trying to figure out how I'm going to do this virtually. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of good things coming in. Like I can see that a lot of teachers are using videos and I think that's a good thing. And like quizzes, simulations, a lot of uh, tools for collaboration, which I think it's really nice as well. Neopods also really good and so is Jamboard. Uh, so it definitely um, quite a lot of amazing resources. I think one thing that Rhonda said when he said was about just really being quite selective and using yes. the ones that work for you um, and not all um, the resources are going to be either appropriate for you or your students. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's being able to select the handful that are going to be um, most impactful in your lessons. Yeah, I remember her saying like, uh, use the simplest few, like go to ones that you know work and it's going to be effective. Yeah, sometimes we go to like choosing fancy stuff and they might not be the best ones. Absolutely, Claire. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of good things here. Like I said, this Padlet will be available after the session so everyone can keep contributing and also checking back in to see what others have written so this is a really really good tool uh, i'm going to move on now to the the questions so we have around 15 minutes at the end of the session so i invite everyone here to to ask questions and our panelists will be more than happy to answer them Yeah, just to comment on a few things. Um, yeah, everyone was very happy with the presentations and all the tips that the panelists uh, gave. Um, yeah, there's like specific comments about Karen's doing like the, the mistakes bit and showing the, the real life happening, which is really good for, for learning. Any other questions? Lisa, I can see somebody asked about how um, how to organize group work um, and uh, okay. and, and um, instructions on doing group work. Um, yeah, group work is quite challenging online, especially uh, when you're not fully sure about the context of all your students that might be working remotely and, and who is um, in a quiet place and who isn't and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, it depends a little bit on, on how you're interacting with them. Um, in, in some of the programs, if you use Teams, you can either do it randomly or you can select the students that are working together. Um, and I think for me, the key thing really is about the size of the groups. Um, I found that um, when I've been doing things in school, I might use smaller groups, but when I'm working online, it's actually better that they're in slightly bigger groups uh, because it's often that one of the students isn't able to engage with the, the interact with whatever we're doing online as much as you might expect and so I've made my group sizes maybe one person more than I might have done uh, when I've been in the classroom. Thank you Claire. Yeah I, I see a question here coming from a practical way to teach geometry during online learning and I've mentioned these in the the morning session something that I've used with my students before that is uh, GeoGebra and someone actually mentioned that Akon, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly mentioned that so GeoGebra it's a really great free tool to teach geometry so they will they will need to to construct the shapes and everything properly for it to work and also you can show how dynamic geometry can be that uh, and that's a specific example as well of what Rhonda mentioned about like what you can do with technology that you wouldn't be doing face to face so it's really hard face to face to show uh, how dynamic geometry can be but with GeoGebra you can definitely do that so it's quite uh, a good tool and it's really interesting. Um, we have a question here about uh, mathematics softwares for Cambridge Primary. Does anyone have anything to add? Uh, 
I can see a question from Ray, who's asked about um, ensuring that students are doing their own work during exams. Um, yeah, that's definitely a challenge. Um, ideally, obviously, uh, doing exams at home, I think, is also distracting for the students because they might have all sorts of other things going on in the background and not have a quiet place to work. Um, one thing is that we've been doing is to ask the students to actually write their answers by hand uh, and then photograph them. There are quite a few apps that you can use to quickly photograph and then convert into PDFs and send them in that way rather than typing on the screen because then you can definitely see it's in their own hand. Um, we've also um, made sure that we've handed out um, the question paper very much just at the point of them needing to do it and then had a deadline for them to get them back in so that they weren't able to have them too long. I think for us in science, um, there's always the, the question of um, those, those types of questions are really just recall AO1 kind of questions and they could look them up online. Um, so we've actually adapted quite a lot of our tests and asked our students to in fact make their own crib sheets. Um, and so that we've blatantly said to them, use your notes, um, and that we've made the questions, questions that they would not be able to answer uh, without um, some sort of application of that knowledge, and um, clearly told them that, that that's not what we're going to be assessing while we're online, which isn't um, a full balance of, of everything. But um, yeah, that's, that's a tricky one, what, how to assess students online. Thank you, Claire. Do you want to add anything, Karen? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to repeat the question. I actually had students walk into the classroom, so I'm just going to see what's going on. That's okay. It's about like assessment and how to make sure that um, the, the students are doing the work themselves. How do you ensure that that's happening? Well, that, that is the uh, yeah question there. That is very difficult. I hate to say you really have to have a relationship with your students. I know my remote students, I have to trust them, a lot of them, that they're not going to cheat because a lot of the questions, the answer is they can pull up online. Uh, they also have textbooks and everything. But also make sure that you know you have enough questions in your test that they have to use the allotted time. For example, mine are on Blackboard. They get a finite amount of time. If they spend a lot of time looking up answers, they might get that question right, but the other ones they'll never get to. So um, I really have to judge the time I give for a test with um, the amount of questions to kind of ensure. I mean. I, I can't even tell you how many times in like IGCSE that um, I'm trying to ask them normal, you know, how to name a compound and they can put it into Google and find it. So I'm making up compounds that do not exist, but they still use the same naming rules. So if they pull up something that's online, because Google will give you something close to it, then I know that they've actually uh, cheated and they've looked up something. But this is what we're all dealing with. I, I wish I had a great answer. Thank you, Carrie. In my opinion, that was a great answer. <laughs> so why are you here, actually, Carrie? I have another question for you, and it's about uh, practicals again. Uh, so uh, Kernia, I think that's how I pronounce the name, uh, mentions that it's still a challenge for, for them is to teach uh, microscopic practicals. So how how do you do that? Like because they think that simulation will not be the same. Do you have any tips? Oh, uh, not really great ones. Except for there are some apps you can get on your cell phone that you can put your cell phone over the microscope and you can record what's going on. So you can record yourself focusing something down, moving a slide over or a pointer over to kind of look at something, and then post your video that you have recorded into onto your blackboard page or just pull it up for your normal zoom and showing it to your students at home uh, that's the best way i've kind of gotten there i mean except for finding things online but they actually the students have to be able to focus a microscope and find things themselves so that's part of the setup type things that i i talked about how to get them ready to do something 
If I can just add there, Melissa, um, we're going to be doing a session on practical work um, as a breakout next week, myself and um, another colleague called Richard. And so we'll be talking more about um, practical work then. And I think there might be a, a link that might come up in the chat to how to get onto that session if you'd like to discuss more about practical work that next week. And I'll, um, I'll try and dig out a resource for you that I've used um, for microscope work um, from home for then. Thank you, Claire. And now that you talk about like finding a resource and we, we've heard Rhonda saying as well about like uh, choosing a few and making sure they work. Do you have some go to resources that you're always using, Claire, for example, because it's what Karen mentioned before, like a year ago when we started, we were like, oh, my God, what do I do? But now that you've been doing that for a while, do you have these go to resources that you're always using? Uh, that's a good question, Melissa. Um, I think I've got a few. Um, one is the one that um, Nevedita mentioned earlier on, and that, that is actually that there's a lot on Resource Plus for us as science teachers. Um, so um, there's some fantastic practicals that have been done there, as well as other resources that the students can interact with. I don't know if she wants to add a bit more to that, but that's one of the, the um, resources that my students have found incredibly useful. I think being able to stop it and um, have a look at um, it part way through and know that it's directly linked with the syllabus has been um, particularly useful. Thank you, Claire. Do you want to add anything, Nived? Yeah, just that uh, we have it available in all science subjects and uh, it's free of cost uh, during the COVID times. And it has some really, really good uh, worksheets as well. So not only just the uh, practicals, the simulations, but also the worksheets uh, connected to them. And also, we now have produced a learner's version of it. So your students, you can also tell your students to access the, those and download those and go through those. Thank you. Do That's you a have a, a go to, uh, Karen? I'm sorry again. What was the question? <laughs> the question was, um, do you have like after a year now that you've been doing it? And of course, I believe things are a little bit easier. Do you have some resources <laughs> that you, you rely on, like you go to and you, you use more often than others? I hate to say I use a lot of my own generated uh, material, a lot of my own videos. And then I, you know, Again, I'll pull practicals and things straight from the Cambridge website, and I walk my students students through the calculations and things like that. I do have a few virtual ones that I use. It was a company called Busy Science. I'll put it in the chat here. It's something new here in the United States. It's more geared towards AP chemistry than Cambridge chemistry, but I have liked the virtual lab uh, so far for a lot of my, especially my IGCSE students. I have not used it with my AS level students, but I did use it for IGCSE and they liked it. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, I can see there are some questions here about uh, Cambridge moving their uh, assessments to be online. And yes, that's definitely something that we are investigating. But as Amira mentioned here that she asked yesterday, and yes, my answer is the same. It is being investigated, but yeah, we need to make sure that it's properly done to ensure fairness and to ensure that we're doing it correctly. So yeah, it is something that we are looking at, okay? Um, do we have any other questions that I have missed? I think we have covered pretty much. Yeah. Uh, chat. Yeah, there are some people asking about the recorded version of the, the presentation. Yes, it will be shared later. Okay, everyone will have access to it. Okay, any other final tips or anything that our panelists want to share? Again, this is Karen talking. When you're coming time for the exams, remind the students that Cambridge is not looking for perfection. 
when you're doing the practical, especially since it's the first time and they're going to be very nervous, make, they just need to prove to Cambridge they understand the concepts. We're, we're not looking for everything to be perfect, just an understanding of what's going on and take some of the pressure off of them because I know they're extremely nervous about this coming up, having never done a practical, could have been this would be the first time. And I'd add to that, um, that actually I think we always sometimes get bogged down in all this assessment and, and all, all the other things that are going on at the moment. But there's a lot to be said for just enjoying learning and, and having inspiring, exciting lessons just for the love of learning rather than necessarily always focusing on um, assessment and, and what we need to achieve in terms of a curriculum. Um, and, and I've definitely deviated off. Um, syllabus at points during the year, particularly where things have come up about COVID and it's been linked in. So um, talking about our numbers in maths and, and how the vaccine works um, and how that's linked with different parts of the syllabus, but also just beyond and, and further from it, just so that they can explore and, and love uh, learning for the sake of it. I think that was really interesting last year where we didn't have exams and suddenly a lot of students started asking, you know, why are we in school? And, and it's not to pass an exam so much as to, to learn and, and to discover new things. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, Claire and, and Carrie. And I, I, I'd like to add as well that sometimes we get so worried about what is it that students missed with being remotely, not being in school, that we forget to think on the, to, to focus on the positives and also think about like, they becoming more autonomous for those students that actually struggle to be in a room they're shy that don't interact with others very well the online environment actually is very good for them so i think it's um it's also like we need to focus on things that they have learned and not just the things that they haven't and uh like you said claire it's not all about testing and assessment it's it's learning for learning for life. And that's what us in Cambridge as well, we would like to encourage. Uh, yeah, Amira mentioned something here in the chat talking about like, it's tough on both students and teachers. So it's kind of a transitional stage in education that we're not, we all need to, to take some time to, to assimilate it and then to, to accept it. But yeah, it's, it's a very interesting uh, year for sure. So yeah, I'm afraid we're running out of time now. Um, I would like to, to finish off thanking our panelists for their participation and everyone that joined us today and contributed to this very interesting session. I hope you all enjoyed as much as I did. Thank you very much, everyone, and I, enjoy, I, I wish you all the best. Thank you. <laughs>